We're reading first this morning in Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah 49, verses 8 through 13. Thus says the Lord, in a favorable time I have answered you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. And I will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people to restore them, uh, to restore the land, to make them inherit the desolate, desolate heritages saying to those who are bound, go forth. To those who are in darkness, show yourselves. Along the roads they will feed, and their pastures will be on the bare heights. They will not hunger or thirst, nor will the scorching heat or sun strike them down. For he who has compassion on them will lead them and will guide them to springs of water. I will make all my mountains a road, and my highways will be raised up. Behold, these will come from afar, and lo, these will come from the north, and from the west, and from the land of Shinnom. Shout for joy, O heavens, and rejoice, O earth. Break forth into joyful shouting, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted His people And we'll have compassion on the afflicted. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 10 is our text. We'll begin reading at verse 3, uh, verse 1 rather. 1 Thessalonians 3, beginning at verse 1. This is God's inspired and infallible word. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this, for indeed, When we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer affliction. And so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, and has brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Be seated, please. Let's pray together. O Lord our God, incline our hearts toward your testimonies. Open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your holy word. Unite our hearts to fear your name. Send out the light and truth of your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Let 
Let him bring us, lead us and bring us to your holy hill and to your dwelling places. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Solomon wrote in Proverbs 25, verse 25, that good news from a distant land is like water to a weary soul. Perhaps you can think back in your lives on a time when someone distant to you, a family member, a friend, uh, was suffering, undergoing uh, health issues, undergoing trials or, or tribulations. You're greatly concerned for them. And then after uh, having not heard from them for a time, you received word. Uh, that the Lord had been gracious to them, that He had brought healing to them, that He had dealt mercifully uh, with regard to the, the trial or uh, the, the affliction that they had been undergoing. It's like cold water to a weary soul. Solomon, the preacher, writes. That's how Timothy's report on Conditions in the church in Thessalonica must have seemed to Paul. Timothy, we noted last Lord's Day in the first five verses of this third chapter, was sent to Thessalonica on a nurturing and a fact-finding mission. Paul was desperate to know how this a fledgling church in Thessalonica was, was doing, how they were getting on, how, were they, how they were coping with the opposition that they were facing there. He feared that their faith might have been shaken. He writes in those first five verses that he was thwarted by Satan from visiting the church. And so he would sent Timothy to strengthen the church, to, to comfort the church, and to find out what he could about their faith. It was a, a mission within this second missionary campaign. Timothy had returned, as we read uh, in verse 6 of our text. Timothy is back. And along with Silas, he'd been united, reunited with Paul in the city of Corinth. We read about that in Acts chapter 18 and verse 5. Remember, that's the city from which Paul is writing this letter. And Timothy is able to pass on a good report of the faith of the church in Thessalonica. When Paul writes about the good news that Timothy brings, he uses a term that's otherwise only used in reference to gospel preaching. Everywhere else that we find this word in the New Testament uh, that's translated good news here, it has reference to the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Timothy's report had fallen on Paul's ears like the good news of the gospel. We learn here that our faith is encouraged when we observed others uh, we observe others persevering in trials. Our faith is encouraged. Our faith ought to be encouraged when we observe others persevering in trials. When we, when we hear reports of others in other lands or in our own land undergoing a trial or, or persecution and we hear uh, good news, good news, 
concerning their perseverance that ought to be an encouragement to our own faith. As we think about Timothy's report, this, uh, today we'll, we'll look at first at the content of uh, his good news and then the effects of that good news. The content of Timothy's good news, the effects of Timothy's good news. First, uh, in regard to the content of Timothy's good news, that good news concerned their faith and love. Notice, Timothy has come to us, verse 6 says, he's brought good news of your faith and love. Now you remember, uh, as we began this epistle some weeks ago, we were considering uh, Paul's, the, the prayer of thanksgiving that Paul gives. It's recorded, or that Paul speaks about in verse, uh, verses 2 and 3. Paul says, we give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. Can you imagine how encouraging it would have been for Paul to receive that report from Timothy? The very work of the Holy Spirit that, that, uh, that God was, was bringing to bear upon their hearts in faith and love was, was continuing in spite of what they were suffering. They hadn't abandoned their newfound belief, their new hope in, uh, in Jesus Christ. They were, uh, as Paul uh, writes in chapter 1 and verse 9 and 10, they, they, they themselves, uh, uh, ch churches in other lands, are reporting uh, what kind of reception uh, we had with you and how you turned from uh, turn to God from idols to serve a living and true God Verse 10, to wait on his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. That work of faith was continuing in the life, and it was bearing the fruit of love. Faith inevitably bears the fruit of love in the heart of a Christian. Paul would later encourage the church at Thessalonica in chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Now, as for the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves are taught to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, excel still more. They were excelling still more in, in their love. This divinely wrought, this fruit of the Spirit in their hearts. And Paul rejoiced that it was flourishing among them. Faith and love, these are the essence of the Christian life. Through faith, which is itself a gift from God, we come to know of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're brought into the sphere of His empowering grace. And that grace inevitably expresses itself in a God-like love. Divine love. Love begets love in the objects of divine grace. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 tell us. Beloved, let us love one another, for God is love. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Where faith and love abide together, these are sure tokens of the saving power of the gospel. 
But Timothy also brought news of a more personal nature, which would have brought great encouragement to Paul's heart, given uh, what we have understood were false reports about Paul uh, and Timothy and Silas, false reports by gospel enemies who were saying that these men had abandoned them, uh, apparently, um, that they uh, were too afraid to return to them. Timothy tells Paul that the church in Thessalonica always remembered them kindly, that they longed to see the mission team again, just as the mission team longed to see them. They'd only the best of memories of Paul and his companions. They wanted to see them again. This was all wonderfully good news to Paul. How could it be otherwise than good news? Paul... Uh, Paul's personal bond with the uh, members of the church in Thessalonica, not only that church, but all, all of the churches, highlight uh, the, re- the relational aspect of the Christian ministry, the importance of the bonds of relationships in the Christian ministry. Christian ministry is hard. Because it takes place in the context of relationships. Because that means that Christian ministry is fraught with relational difficulties. It means that there will be conflict. It means that that conflict must be dealt with. It means that there must be confrontation between those who offend and those who are offended. And it means that there must be a resolution to that conflict. And when conflict isn't resolved, it can mean estrangement, which always causes pain. But for the same reason, Christian ministry is glorious because it takes place in the context of loving, personal relationships between those who share a common bond in a Savior. Christians have this connection. Christians share this bond that the world knows nothing at all about. Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are thrown together in a mix in the church. The the love of God is being wrought in their hearts and it creates within them a love for others, a love for God and and a love for others. That the world knows nothing at all about. And Christians alone possess a full toolbox for dealing with relational difficulties, for conflict resolution. And Christians have been given a divine mandate to resolve relational difficulties, to preserve mutual affection for one another and to develop develop the kinds of bonds that Paul is writing about here in 1 Thessalonians. Faith and love and the great encouragement that the Thessalonian church yet thinks highly and fondly of Paul and his co-labors. Timothy's good news, the content of, of that good news. But then secondly, in verses uh, 7 to the end of our text, we see the effects of Timothy's good news. And the first is in verse 7. Notice uh, encouragement 
in affliction. When Timothy's good news reached Paul, he was, he was himself burdened by affliction. He was in the midst of his own deep troubles in Corinth. You, uh, you can see that on the face of First and Second Corinthians, the kind of difficulties that Paul dealt with in the church at Corinth. Missionary activity, which is never easy at any time, had been particularly difficult for Paul in Corinth. He writes in 2 Corinthians 11.28 of suffering distress and affliction, pressing cares of the strongest sort that arose in part from the difficulties he faced in Corinth itself, and then for the con continuing concern that he had for the church at large. And it was under these burdens that the good news of uh, this good report from Timothy uh, reached the Apostle Paul's ears and brought encouragement and comfort. Although in some cases uh, rendered differently in our English translations, Paul uses the same word in verse 7 for the effect of the good news as he does with regard to Timothy's mission in verse 2. It's a word that we looked at last week in verse 2, a word, uh, this word rendered encouragement or comfort or exhortation has a broad range of, of meanings depending on the context. So Paul sends Timothy to comfort, uh, to encourage, to exhort the Thessalonians, and he gets a report back from, from Timothy that is encouraging and comforting and serves as an exhortation to him. Do you see the reciprocity here? That's what the good news of the gospel does. It, it runs both ways. It's a, it's a reciprocity that's woven into the fabric of God's sanctifying work among His people. And Paul will speak about that reciprocity in 2 in Corinthians chapter 1. Verses 3 to 7, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort. So he's speaking here, he's writing here in the context of, of comfort to God's people who comforts us in all of our affliction so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. But if we're afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. Or if we're comforted, it's for your comfort, Paul writes, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. And our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our, our sufferings, so also you are sharers of our comforts. That's how things work in the Christian church. Christians who are undergoing afflictions are themselves an exhortation to others who are undergoing afflictions. Paul's, uh, Timothy's good news did more than, that, uh, than to encourage Paul. Paul says uh, in, in verse 8 that, as, as we might put it, it gave him a new lease on life. For now we really live, Paul says, if you stand firm in the Lord. 
That's, a, that's an expression, a new lease on life is an expression used when some substantial life impacting burden is lifted from us. Perhaps we get, someone gets the news that, uh, that they're clear and free from cancer after a long struggle uh, with it. Or after a, a long period of, of dealing with the burden of debt, now they're out from under that debt. And they might say, I've got a new lease on life. That's how Paul felt about Timothy's good news. The apostle's entire life was bound up in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He lived to see men and women changed by the power of the gospel and brought into a living bond of faith and continuing in a living bond of faith with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what made Paul tick. Nothing disheartened him more than to, than to, to have people make a profession of faith and show promising progress in the faith only to wither under the, the heat of affliction and persecution. And on the other hand, nothing gave him greater encouragement than to see people thrive under the gospel, to see those who were standing firm in faith and love. News of this kind, seeing others press on in difficult times, is, or at least ought to be to us, one of the greatest encouragements for us to press on in trials and affliction. The Christian life is a light to others. You are a light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus taught, isn't it? Jesus himself taught that Christians themselves are light and we emanate the light of the gospel. And it, it has an impact. Light has an impact on others. Christians undergoing perse uh, persecution serve as an exhortation to others to persevere. In the faith. That's how things work. That's woven in to the fabric of the gospel of Jesus Christ and God's saving work in His people. So Timothy's news brought encouragement. It, it so to speak, gave Paul a, a new lease on life. But then, note furthermore, it also filled him with joyful thanksgiving to God. What thanks can we render to God in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? Verse 9. That good news filled him with, with joy. It's not, not merely a, an emotional response to this report, but it's a spiritual joy. Notice in verse 9. It's before the Lord. It's in God's presence. It's, a, it's a, 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 a spiritual joy in the presence of the Lord. And since Paul lived in an atmosphere of communion with God, we may presume that his instinctive response to Timothy's good news was to pray. When he received this good news, his, his gut response was to pray, to be joyously prayerful before the Lord. 
And as he prayed, he was conscious of being filled with that joy, an overwhelming joy, an inexpressible joy. And that, in, in turn, prompted Paul to thank God. He recognized that God was the author of uh, this faith and love, the, the work of grace in the life of the, of the Thessalonians, and of the joy that, that he was experiencing in his own heart. And it was so overwhelming to him that he couldn't find words to express his thanksgiving to God. How could he ever thank God enough for what he had done? Paul's echoing the sentiments of the psalmist in the 116th Psalm. What shall I render to the Lord for all? He has done for me. But then notice as well uh, in verse 10 that Timothy's report injected fresh fuel into uh, the prayer lives uh, of the missionaries. Paul and his ministry team, he says in chapter uh, 1 and verse 2, had always prayed and had consistently prayed for the church at Thessalonica. But this fresh news, he, he writes in verse 10, added urgency uh, to his prayers for them. Prayer, joy, and thanksgiving. All of these go together in the life of the Christian. As Paul brought this good, uh, Timothy brought this good news, he also uh, reveals in, here in verse 10 uh, that there was something lacking yet in their faith. Now Paul will go on to, to, to outline some of those things that, that were lacking in uh, their faith, which is understandable given the short time that, uh, that the missionaries had spent in Thessalonica. Apparently there were, there were truths that, that they didn't understand, uh, that, they, uh, that they didn't know at all, or, or patterns of living that weren't consistent with the gospel. And those later sections of the letter will reveal what some of those were. In other words, there was, there was still much to do and much to supply in their faith, to straighten out, to set in order. And Paul knew that some of these needs could be met by, by way of this letter, but he knew that nothing would substitute for a face-to-face -face meeting. So he prays among the prayer, uh, prayers that he, he lifts up for uh, the church at Thessalonica. Uh, it's the prayer that they would see their face again so they can complete what was lacking in their faith. Fervent prayers for the church. When there's intense concern in the life of the church, what should be our first response? What's the first thing that we ought to do? When there's a crisis of faith, when there's a lack of, of, of love uh, in the church, when there's conflict in the church, when the church is burdened, what should be the first response? Fervent prayer. And where that's missing, it either points to a crisis in faith or a sad lack of concern and love for others. Our faith is encouraged when we observe others persevering in the faith. 
Well, there are a number of things that we could think about as we consider what we should take away from this text. Well, we've already mentioned a number of them, not the least of which is this, this burden of prayer that we ought to have, this continual prayer of, and uh, thanking God and, and rejoicing uh, in the Lord. Rejoicing before Him in prayer. But perhaps more than anything else in this text, what shines through is Paul's devotion to Jesus Christ. Verse 8 contains one of those characteristic statements with regard to Paul. It's a statement that shows what made his heart beat. Now we really live, he says, if we know that you are enduring, if you're persevering in faith and love. That's what motivated Paul. More than anything else, that was his passion. That was his focus. The church of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the slang expressions uh, used today uh, shows a dismay over those who have devoted their lives to things that really aren't worthwhile. Get a life, uh, we say. When someone is obviously wasting his time or, or wasting his passion. Now to someone outside the church, to a, a worldly outsider, that slur might have been directed to Paul. Get a life, Paul. You really live? If the church of Jesus Christ is thriving, find something more worthwhile to give your time and your passion to. After all, Paul was a brilliant man. He was an able man, but he wasn't pursuing uh, the things that matter the most in the world's eyes, money, earthly power, prestige, or, or pleasure. But for Paul, Nothing mattered to him more than the gospel of Christ and the church that Jesus Christ was building. So that he will say in his letter to the Philippians, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor to me, but I don't know which to choose. I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet, to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. So, for Paul, here were the competing interests in his life. Jesus and being in the presence of Christ and the welfare of the church of Christ. Nothing else mattered. Dear Christians, this is what we ought to long for and strive for above all else in the Christian experience. That Jesus would be our all in all. And that because Jesus Christ has said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That that would be our consuming passion as well.
Let's pray. Our God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit, we love you, we love your church, and we long to have your apostles' perspective. We long, O Lord, to have all of our passion, our energies consumed by Christ and His church. Would you work in us, O Lord, work profoundly in our souls, awaken the deadness of our hearts towards the things of Christ and His kingdom. Enliven us, O Lord. Give us greater longings for Christ and for His presence, His communion, for heaven itself, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.